Mr. Secretary, I want to talk first about Turkey. How important is Turkey to the United States? Turkey is a, a very important NATO ally uh, and uh, represents uh, an important buffer between Europe and the Middle East. And as a result, uh, we have relied a great deal on Turkey to uh, assist us, particularly uh, with our military missions in that part of the world. Uh, so Turkey, I think, overall uh, represents a, a very important ally for the United States. In light of that, I don't mean to jump ahead, I want to ask you about this a little bit later, but if, if Turkey is such an important NATO ally, do we seem to be slipping in our relationship with them in, in favor of Turkey and Russia? They've just bought the S-400 defense system from Russia, and it seems like they are leaning towards Russia. Well, there's no question that uh, we are in a difficult period with uh, Turkey uh, because of the issue over the pastor, because of uh, the uh, growing authoritarianism uh, in Turkey, uh, because of the increase in tariffs now uh, that uh, have impacted their economy and uh, hit the lira. Uh, so there, there's a number of areas of friction uh, with Turkey. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we have had those areas of friction in the past and have always found some way to try to resolve them. And I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to do the same uh, with this crisis. Let me ask you the first question from the first one I asked you. How important is the United States to Turkey? Well, I think the fact is that uh, uh, Turkey has always taken a position of power within uh, the Muslim world, very different from Iran, very different from other Muslim countries, but it has always uh, kind of assumed this role uh, of being a, a key power that can not only relate to Europe, but obviously can relate to the Middle East. So as a result of that, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think Turkey uh, does in fact uh, play a very important role. Uh, and is important for the United States to be able to maintain a relationship with Turkey as a result of that. So, you know, we're going through a difficult period, no question about it. The president himself has said that. But my experience has always been, both in my role as director of the CIA and as secretary of defense, that when I went to Turkey and met with their leadership, uh, they were always uh, very cooperative. We were always able to to work together on issues of intelligence as well as defense issues. Uh, and I hope that somehow we can get back to that because the relationship, the military, security, financial relationship uh, is extremely important to both countries. Well, it seems like sort of a breaking point or a tension point certainly right now is Pastor Brunson, who's been in custody, he was arrested in October of 2016, and President Trump says that he thought he had a deal to have him released. He was not, he was released to house arrest, not released completely so he could return to his home or even come to the United States. And now we hear that the president says, President Trump says there'll be no more concessions that he wants Pastor Brunson. So now what happens? Well, you know, uh, uh, President Trump uh, always takes a tough negotiating stand uh, uh, in a number of areas, and this is one of them. But uh, in the end, uh, you know, I think the United States uh, has to recognize that uh, we do not want a Turkey that is having such serious economic problems uh, that uh, those problems impact uh, on the economy of the world. Uh, in addition to that, uh, because we have a very important reliance uh, from our military on bases in Turkey, uh, we don't want to face a situation where Turkey suddenly begins to threaten us with shutting down uh, that military base. So for all those reasons, at some point, uh, I think if we continue at least communicating through diplomatic channels, I think they'll be able to find a way to resolve this issue with the pastor and with our relationship with Turkey. Well, President Trump has, has sort of upped the ante. He has imposed those tariffs, particularly on steel and on aluminum, um, Turkish steel and aluminum, and, the, and President 
Erdogan of Turkey has at least made suggestions that it is uh, that is affecting their economy, and he has he has also imposed sanctions. But the lira, as you noted, the the currency of Turkey is declining, so their economy is is really being pinched by these sanctions. So where does that lead us? Well, you know, you've raised uh, you've raised a good question because uh, uh, you know we we have a president who uh, deals with these issues. Uh, through a disruption. He basically likes to, uh, uh, to shake things up. Uh, he's done that with tariffs being imposed uh, on our European allies, on Canada and Mexico. Uh, but as to where the path is uh, that will allow us to work through this, it, that's not very clear. Uh, and in some ways, the same thing is true here with regards to Turkey. Uh, he's imposed these tariffs. Uh, he's shaking up the relationship. There's clearly disruption here. Uh, but I'm not quite sure what the ultimate strategy is. Uh, but I also know that, uh, that people uh, within the Trump administration, uh, Secretary of the Treasury, Secretary of Commerce, Secretary of Defense, uh, all of them are concerned that somehow we have to resolve these differences. So because of that, I ultimately think that the president uh, will find a way to uh, negotiate our differences and try to uh, restore the relationship with Turkey. All right, let me circle back then to the earlier part of our discussion. Um, is there a chance in your mind that Turkey, Erdogan is going to, and President Trump are going to come to such loggerheads that Erdogan is going to lean even more heavily on Russia, even to the point of perhaps even withdrawing from NATO? I think that's a danger, uh, obviously, uh, because uh, the longer this goes on, uh, the more Turkey uh, will rely on Russia, uh, the more uh, other countries uh, in that region uh, will look to Russia for leadership uh, in the Middle East. Uh, and uh, Russia, obviously, through the aggression in Syria, uh, took that step in order to establish a foothold in the Middle East. So I think the United States has to be concerned that if we don't restore uh, our traditional alliances in that part of the world with Turkey and with our uh, moderate Arab countries uh, in that region, that if we don't have a coalition that is able to deal with threats from Iran, threats from ISIS, uh, and threats from terrorism, uh, I think it will weaken the United States' position not only in the world, but it will weaken our, our position with regards to the security steps that are necessary for us to take, uh, and we need Turkey in order to be able to do that. But Turkey, on the, on the other hand, also uh, is fearful or, or suspicious that we are in somehow in cahoots with the Kurds because we have backed the Kurds fighting in Syria. And of course, the Kurds, there's an, an insurgency group in Syria, and um, Erdogan thinks that they are trying to overthrow him. So you've, you've also got to factor into the Kurdish problem into this. No, there's no question. Uh, that has long been an aggravation in the relationship between Turkey and the United States. Uh, they consider uh, elements uh, of the Kurds uh, to be anti-Turkey, uh, to be involved in terrorism in Turkey, uh, and as a result have confronted uh, that group for a long time. But we have always walked a fine line here because uh, in Iraq, uh, the Kurds dominate the northern part of Iraq. Uh, and at the same time, while uh, the, the Turks have been concerned uh, about uh, uh, one element of the Kurds, we have still been able to resolve uh, issues with Turkey, uh, e despite the concern about uh, the Kurds. Now, Syria, uh, they've obviously objected to our use of the Kurds there. But at the same time, the United States has been successful in using Kurds against ISIS, uh, and we should continue to do that. Uh, look, you know, the bottom line in this relationship is that when you look at the underlying fundamentals uh, that are involved in this relationship, both countries need each other. Uh, and uh, despite our differences as we've had in the past, despite the areas of friction, I think ultimately both countries are going to have to recognize that they have to resolve these issues in order to be able 
uh, to uh, continue to conduct uh, diplomacy in uh, the world of the 21st century. So what would be, if you were in your old job as Secretary of Defense or Director of the CIA for this new president, President Trump, what would you advise him as to this particular problem with Turkey? I mean, uh, how, how does this get resolved? I think it gets resolved like, uh, like other problems get resolved by uh, asking uh, Secretary Pompeo, uh, Secretary Mattis, uh, to engage with, uh, uh, with the Turks uh, and uh, with uh, uh, Prime Minister uh, Erdogan, uh, President Erdogan, uh, and try to at least open up a channel of communications where uh, our diplomats can sit down and try to see if there isn't a way to resolve some of these differences that we have. Uh, the only way this is going to be resolved is if there is a real effort at trying to continue to communicate uh, with Erdogan and with uh, our, our uh, counterparts uh, in Turkey. Uh, that's the way you get things done. If you shut that door, if you continue to fight each other, if uh, the United States continues to increase tariffs, uh, if Turkey continues to, uh, uh, to reach out to Russia and others, uh, then uh, that, that important relationship uh, could, uh, could be severed uh, in a way that will hurt the security of not only both countries, but the security of the world. Let me ask you one other thing that factors into this in my mind is that President Trump says he wants that pastor released. President Erdogan says, that, well, you give us Gulan, who is the, who is the Turkish individual in Pennsylvania, who he believes is, was the one who provoked the attempted coup back in July of 2016. So what if Erdogan says, we want Gulan. Um, if you want the pastor, you've got to give us Gulan. Well, you know, I, I think, <laughs> I think we, uh, we certainly had to expect that that would be the deal that uh, Erdogan would suggest, uh, that, uh, you know, we would, uh, uh, we would send this individual to Turkey in exchange for the pastor. I think uh, that, you know, that didn't require an awful lot of thinking as to uh, where that negotiation might go. Uh, but in the end, I think the question is going to be whether the United States uh, indeed wants to, uh, to cut that deal, or if not, uh, are there other matters that uh, concern Turkey? that we can put on the table that can appeal to them. I'm sure that if we were to uh, agree to lessen our tariffs uh, on their goods, uh, to try to uh, do what we can to support the lira, uh, I think that would be very meaningful to Turkey at this difficult time. Uh, and that could be used as leverage in order to get the pastor back. All right. One of the big controversies consuming the nation right now has to do with the security clearance that President Trump has lifted from former CIA Director Brennan. Of course, that's a job that you once had as well. Do you still, as a prior uh, Secretary of Defense or prior Director of the CIA, do you have a security clearance? Uh, my understanding is that uh, if I were to be called for advice back to Washington, uh, that there is a security clearance there that would be available to allow me to get classified information in order to provide that advice either to the director of the CIA or the secretary of defense. So, so it, do you think that that's the same that applies to former director Brennan in the sense that he's not, you know, he, he, if he's not being consulted, he does not have an active security clearance. So what was lifted from him by the president? Well, I, I think uh, that the president has uh, revoked uh, his uh, security clearance uh, under all circumstances. So uh, it, it would be, it'd be very difficult if uh, the CIA director were to convene a group of CIA, past CIA directors uh, and allowed them to uh, be briefed on classified information. Uh, I don't think that John Prennan could participate in that kind of uh, advice to the CIA director. But neither could you unless you also got your, you know, got your clearance re-upped. I mean, right now you couldn't do that without getting something in terms of a security clearance, a green yeah. light. So he's, 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 yeah, a, no, he's in the same position. That's correct. Uh, 
All right. So, um, so in some ways, then well, well, except <laughs> I, I think when the president says he's revoking your security clearance, uh, it means that it cannot be reestablished under any circumstances. So I think that's the difference. All right, you have signed a letter along with the many others who have served in the intelligence uh, community uh, saying that you oppose what President did in, in lifting or revoking the security clearance for Director uh, Brennan. Is, and, and that was done, as I understand it, from what the President said, because of some of the things that Brennan said, including that he made the reference to um, treason and the President. Is there any line in your mind when when the president would be, have authority to revoke a security clearance? Is, is there anything that a f former director of CIA could say or do? I think uh, I think because our security clearance is a national security issue and involves our national security interests, that's why we provide those clearances is to deal with national security issues that uh, pursuant to the executive order, uh, the only way to revoke a security clearance is to present uh, an argument that lays out the national security issues that would be involved in that kind of revocation. Uh, that was not the case here. Uh, the president revoked it because uh, he himself said uh, he didn't like uh, what Brennan said. He didn't like Brennan's relationship to the Russian investigation. Uh, and very frankly, the concern that we had in signing that letter is that uh, the revocation of a security clearance, now instead of being based on national security issues, is being used as a political weapon to, uh, to stifle free speech and to uh, try to uh, retaliate against somebody whose views the president doesn't share. Uh, that is not a basis for revoking a security clearance. I guess, and, and I guess that because you understand security clearances, from the citizen's viewpoint, I, if I could be so presumptuous to take the citizen's viewpoint uh, in some instance, is that I, I thought he was getting routine security briefings. So I suspected that when he was making those statements, statements like treason, that he somehow had some inside knowledge and that that would go to national security if, he is some, if he's trying to send a message out there that would be contrary, for instance, to this president's administration or any. But, but, he, but he, he doesn't. Of course, he's not getting these daily briefings or weekly briefings. Is that right? That's correct. So, so this whole, so it, it really does look like, uh, it, it, it does look like some. Maybe the, maybe the president and uh, Director Brennan should have a uh, beer summit like President Obama did when he got into a fuss, because this is obviously blown up into something and has an enormous impact. Well, yeah, no, I, I think uh, I think it, I think it's a sad situation. Uh, and look, part of this is uh, you know we have a, we have a president who tweets all kinds of things. Uh, calls people dogs, calls people low life, calls people all kinds of things. I don't necessarily agree with what the president tweets, but uh, he's free to say that. This is, this is a country that believes in free speech. Uh, and the same thing is true for John Brennan. The same thing is true for former presidents. Uh, they have the right to express their views. Uh, that, that right to free speech uh, is important to our Constitution and it's important to our democracy. So I think the president has to learn that just because he doesn't like what somebody says, that uh, he doesn't have to uh, use national security uh, issues uh, and a security clearance to retaliate against that individual. That, that then is being used for the purpose of diminishing your right to free speech. And that, I think, is what concerns us and concerns the country. We're approaching very important midterm elections uh, in this country, and now the news has just broken in the last day or so that um, that the Russians are are up to no good again, to, to, trying to create all sorts of havoc uh, in our political system. It was just reported that they were trying to do uh, to. Uh, poison some conservative websites, some Senate, uh, but in, in the bottom line, is it is this cyber warfare? Should we should we call it that? Absolutely, this is a direct cyber attack uh, by the Russians against the United States. It's what they did in 2016, and it's what they continue to do in 2018. Uh, 
And uh, I think the United States uh, has to do everything not only to defend against those kinds of attacks, uh, but I would hope that, uh, that the president is also considering ways to retaliate against the Russians uh, in the cyber arena. We have that capability. We ought to use it. So uh, this is, without question, uh, a very serious uh, attack on our national security interests. To have a country like Russia uh, continue to use their hacking ability, their cyber capability, in order to try to influence uh, the United States' opinion with regards to the election in 2018. That's a direct interference uh, with regards to the United States, and we ought to treat it as an attack on our country. All right, so if you were back in one of your old jobs, Director of CIA or Secretary of Defense, what would you tell the president to do in light of even more compelling information? We get more information all the time about the Russians trying to interfere with our electoral uh, process. What would you tell him to do? I would tell the president of the United States that we cannot simply stand back uh, and allow the Russians to continue to do this. Uh, obviously, we're taking steps, or at least companies like Microsoft are taking steps to identify those particular websites and try to identify uh, how they're using uh, our social media uh, to try to impact on American opinion. But I think when Russia continues to do this, uh, I think it's important for the United States uh, to use every capability we have uh, to let the Russians know that we can do exactly the same thing to them uh, and that the United States uh, ought to make that clear to the Russians that if they continue to do this, we are going to use our cyber capabilities to go after the Russians. Meanwhile, though, the Russians deny it. Putin denies it. Our intelligence, all the intelligence agencies or reports I've heard about say that they are definitely doing it. It seems, you know, uncontroverted by the Senate Intelligence Committees and other intelligence uh, organizations here in the United States that it's happening. But telling Russia, stop it. Do you think that Putin, since he denies it, and he causes so much other mischief, whether it's selling S-400s S to, the, to, the, to Turkey, do you think that that's going to be enough for Putin? Well, I, th I think the greatest problem right now is that the president continues to be ambivalent about whether or not the Russians are doing this. Uh, he, in essence, uh, when he had the summit with Putin, he said uh, he trusted the Russians more than he trusted our own intelligence agencies uh, with regards to their interference uh, in our election. Uh, just the other day, uh, he said, uh, if the Russians are doing this, raising the question about whether or not they truly are doing this. As long as he's sending those kinds of messages, Putin feels he has a license to continue to try to uh, do these cyber attacks against the United States. So I assume that it would be, if you were the Secretary of Defense like Mattis or, the, or, or head of the CIA, you'd be telling him, you know, stop saying that, stop saying if, be, be harder with Putin, say this is going to happen to you, and if, if they continue to do it, then we unleash cyber warfare against the uh, Russians? I think we have the capability to use cyber in an aggressive manner, and we should not hesitate to use it when we are being attacked by the Russians. In addition to that, we need to all have a consistent message. The president, the members of the cabinet, the Congress, both Republicans and Democrats, have to send a clear message that we will not tolerate the Russians continuing to interfere in our election process. And we will take steps to make sure that they will not do this again. Do you worry that there'll be a cyber attack from North Korea? There's a lot of attention, obviously, on the nuclear weapons, which is very dangerous. All their artillery that's facing South Korea on their southern border of North Korea. We, they, we know that they've used chemicals, uh, chemical and biological against a relative of Kim Jong-un. But And they've also had a cyber attack on Sony. And do you worry about our, for instance, our grid or our banking system here and that North Korea will be the one who will launch a cyber attack more aggressively towards the United States? I've always felt that uh, cyber is the battlefield of the future. Uh, and we've seen that happening. 
Uh, obviously, we've, we've seen cyber used to deny services, to uh, go after intellectual uh, property. Uh, but more importantly, we've seen cyber used to destroy. Uh, I think it was Iran that developed something called the Shamoon virus, which uh, destroyed 30,000 computers uh, at Aramco Oil. You use that same kind of virus, you can take down our electric grid, you can take down our chemical systems, our financial systems, you can take down our government systems, you can paralyze this country. So, yes, do I worry about North Korea having that capability? You bet. But I also worry about the Russians doing exactly the same thing. All right, random question. Last question. What's the better job, Secretary of Defense or Director of the CIA? Uh, actually, I really liked being in Congress when I was in Congress because it worked, it worked when I was there. Uh, Republicans and Democrats worked together, and it was actually a lot of fun. But uh, I, I like both uh, CIA director and secretary of defense. CIA, uh, they're very different, but uh, the CIA in some ways uh, is like the Marine Corps. It is self-contained, and I like uh, the, the ability to, to deliver whatever mission the president wanted to deliver on. And, of course, you also were chief of staff to the president of the United States, uh, not the current one, but a former one. You got, that must have been uh, fascinating as well. It was fascinating, tough job. Uh, because, uh, you know, it was uh, during, uh, during the Clinton years. Uh, but I, I had a president uh, who uh, at times, uh, you know, was, was, not, uh, was not willing to assert uh, discipline, but he asked me to do that, and I did. And to the credit of President Clinton, he was willing to accept that discipline. Uh, I would hope that President Trump... Uh, Having uh, somebody like General Kelly as chief of staff who is trying to assert better discipline, it would help if the president uh, would agree to abide by better discipline as president of the United States. Uh, I think it would be to his benefit as president. Mr. Secretary, thank you very much for joining us. And as I told you off camera before, we miss you here in Washington, sir.